All right, well, let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, glad to see you all here and joining us. Uh, this wasn't how we intended, but it's kind of partially normal, I would say, at this point to most folks. So um, we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to start off with getting everyone to do some introductions, and then uh, our, our first action after that is to figure out who would be the commission chair. Um, I know that I'll do a lot of talking because I've kind of organized a lot of this, but that doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to run the meeting uh, as we go through this process um, long term. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to go looking at my screen and introduce, uh, call out a name, and then that have that person uh, go ahead and identify themselves, what role they play uh, here in the city, if they work for the city especially, or if they're just a citizen, um, you know, that they're an interested citizen, um, uh, so that we can kind of understand who's on, on tonight. So I'm going to start uh, on my screen. I have uh, Jason Broadbent, if you would introduce Hello, uh, Jason Broadbent. Uh, captain with Topeka Fire and also a member of Local 83's Executive Board. Okay. Um, Mr. Aaron Freeman, you're next. Aaron Freeman, Lieutenant with Topeka Fire Department, President of Topeka Firefighters Local 83. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Pablo Martinez. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Pablo Martinez, I work for Advisors XL. Uh, Mr. DeBeat Padilla um, got in contact with me, and um, so I volunteered. Appreciate that. Chief Duke. Uh, Craig Duke, Fire Chief, Topeka Fire Department. I'm in my office now with uh, two other members of administration. Uh, Chief of Operations, Ty Christian, and Chief of Training, Kevin Flory. All right, good. David King. Hi, I'm David. I'm the citizen. I work at Topeka and Shawnee County Public Library and was invited to do this, and it sounded interesting. Thanks, David. Appreciate you being here. Councilman Valdivia Aqua. Thank you, Brent. Christina Valdivia Alcala, Councilwoman for District 2. Thank you. Sandra Clear. I am Sandra Clear. And I am an advocate for fire. Thank you, Sandra. Good to see you again. Thanks. Chris Sullivan. Hi, my name is Chris Sullivan. I live in District Two, Christina uh, invited me to uh, uh, actually I kind of asked her to uh, try and get me involved uh, just uh, curious how things are gonna play out and I'd like to be uh, a positive member of the Commission thanks Chris councilwoman Ortiz good evening councilwoman Ortiz um, for district 3 city of Topeka Honorary fire, <laughs> fire promoter. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Nelson Castillo. Hi, Nelson Castillo, Shawnee County Ambulance Compliance Officer. Thanks, Nelson. Appreciate you being here. Um, Mickey's iPad, whomever that is. Good evening, Mickey Huber, Operations Manager for AMR. Thanks, Mickey. Um, Aaron Mahan. Hi, I'm Aaron Mahan. I'm the Interim Director of Shawnee County Emergency Management. Uh, I've probably met maybe half of you in person and had discussions, uh, but we're pretty much available to help out wherever we need. I'm also the Training and Exercise uh, Coordinator for the County and the County's Planning Section Chief. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate you being here. Uh, John Antrim. Oh, you're muted, John.
All right, how about now? Can everyone hear me now? Yep. You know, as much as we've been doing Zoom meetings, you think I'd have the handle of this. But uh, I'm John Antrim. I'm the Regional Director for Global Medical Response, uh, oversee the AMR Topeka Operations. Just uh, excited to be here and, and to do some learning with all of you all. Thanks, John. Um, Richard Siegel. Thank you, Manager. I apologize for not having video tonight, but I'm the Chief of EMS for Topeka Fire Department. Thanks, Richard. Councilman Mike Padilla. Good evening, uh, Councilman for District 5. Uh, just interested in the work of the Commission. Just wanted to see everybody uh, firsthand and uh, listen in. Thanks, Councilman. And then I know that uh, Councilman Mike Lesser is also going to be uh, involved with this at the time, but uh, right now he's uh, uh, recovering. So uh, he'll probably join us hopefully by December. He'll be joining us for that meeting. Um, and there may be a couple of others. We'll, we'll take roll based on the initial, but I think that pretty much uh, puts everybody that uh, we have invited. So it's very exciting to see everybody joining us tonight. Um, so uh, the next thing is to select the commission chair. Um, this was a extra committee established. Um, first thing I wanted to do was offer up if there was one of the city council members that wanted to chair this, uh, that'd be the first choice. Uh, give them first choice if they wanted to. If not, we can open it up to the floor. Okay. Um, so is there anyone from the group that would be interested in being chair? Or you can nominate me. I'm, I'm willing to do it, but I also didn't want to assume. So um, uh, if you have someone that's interested, if they, they're really interested in sharing this, um, I'm willing to let them do that. I nominate you, Brett. <laughs> Councilman Ortiz. I nominate Aaron Freeman. Okay. Any other nominations? All right, Aaron, would you accept if uh, nominated? Brent, my preference would be uh, not to be the chair, but if, uh, if I need to be, I will be. Okay. Well, um, Councilwoman Davidiaklo. I was trying to unmute you. I need to unmute myself. Okay. Um, I would, I don't know if there's seconds involved in this or not, but I would um, agree with Sandy Clear for you as chair. Okay. All right. Uh, Sandra, would you be chair? Are you going to be co chair? I will be co-chair, yes. I'm perfect. Yeah, I'd do, I'd do that. Okay. Anything else? Did we have another nominee? Um, Aaron not, uh, said that he would prefer not to be um, if uh, <laughs> there was others that were interested, but he would take it if there were no others interested. So. Did you mention somebody before I mentioned Aaron? Um, it was mentioned, uh, I think, me or uh, Sandra Clear is right where we're at right now. One of the two of us or us as co-chairs. Are there any more nominees? Not that I'm aware of. Any other nominees, folks? All right. Well, then let's do this this way. Is ever anybody object to Sandra Clear and I co-chairing this committee as we go forward? Any objections? All right. Well, appreciate that. And uh, Sandra and I, Sandra, I'll be in touch too, just to kind of outlay in more detail. But we're going to go through some of it tonight, and uh, I'll kind of uh, keep us going so we get out of here on time or even a little early tonight. Um, so yeah, I'll give you a call uh, the next day or two, and uh, we'll talk more in detail as how we're going to move this forward. So, um, 
The first thing I want to cover, kind of cover, is where I see the purpose of the commission based on the um, request that I made from the governing body to get us together uh, for this committee. Um, I've looked at the charge of the committee to be to study the current provision of fire service in our community and determine the appropriate level and type of fire service for Topeka for the future. Um, it's going to be very broad range. And so that's why there's not a lot specific in there because we're gonna look at uh, many, many facets of, of what we do here um, in, in the provision of fire service. So, uh, and then we have to report, uh, report out to the governing body by no later than April 6, 2021, which is their first meeting in April. So the intent will be is that we um, conduct meetings um, through uh, basically the third Thursday of each month. I guess I'll move on into the process for the commission. Um, we're going to meet the first third Thursday of each month, um, December, January, February, and March, um, talking about various subjects. Um, try to do that from six to eight. I would expect that uh, there's a, a we'll see where we're at with the December, but we'll obviously be uh, continuing to offer the virtual. It just may be that by December, there's the opportunity that we can do a combination of somebody wants to come in or not, but we'll at least make sure um, continue to offer the virtual for, for everyone based on schedules and, and how we're gonna be feeling and dealing with COVID still. So over the next four months, um, we have a number of topics that we're gonna cover and I'll be putting this out on a more detailed list once I talk to Councilwoman Clear, or excuse me, Sandra Clear, Hard to have it to break still. <laughs> uh, talk to Sandra and we'll narrow down these in case there's others that, um, and, and I'll take suggestions from the floor too, as far as subjects. But what I'm looking at is tonight, um, Chief Duke and a couple of the other uh, staff members are gonna go through a kind of a standard to cover and give you a baseline of what the department consists of. Um, budget, uh, our number of fire stations, our equipment, training, staffing, how we're organized as a unit, and, and give you that baseline as to what's, what's the fire department doing now and so on. Because I think we need to start there first. Everybody has the same level as to what we're doing as a provision of fire service today. Then, so that'll be our, uh, our, our big thing we'll accomplish tonight. Um, but there are a number of other topics that we're going to cover. Um, sometime in the next week, you will receive a, a scanned copy of at least three studies that have been done in the past. There were studies done in 2006 regarding fire services by um, emergency services consulting, an outside consultant in 2006. Um, in 2015, there was another study done by an outside firm. And then in 2016, Interim Chief uh, Tim Wayne did a, a review of fire service. And so we're gonna scan those documents and send those to you next within the next few days. So then you can kind of begin to look at what some outside uh, looks have said about the provision of fire service in Topeka. And the city paid a good money for a couple of those studies and wanna make sure you understand what an outside set of eyes talked about with our department. Obviously a 2006 study is a little old, but it's also important to, I think as a baseline as to what others have talked about for our city. And that's kind of what's entered into how, partly how we produce service right now for the community. So we'll look at those studies and then we'll have, a, we'll give those studies to you and then we'll kind of have a, a review, a high level review of them and then ask questions and answer questions as best we can based on the recommendations and comments that were in those studies so that we can uh, understand what others have said. And then I plan to look at talking about prevention versus suppression policies for fire and that type of provision of service. I'm gonna look at the dispatching process so you understand how we dispatch for fires and what types of equipment we send when we go to on fire. Um, give you some numbers related to medical call 
volumes and fire call volumes across our city, the response time that we have for those types of calls and um, what our target times are for those, um, you know, and then understanding what equipment we use right now to go on those calls. And then I want to uh, have the fire marshal talk about uh, uh, how they provide their services and do investigations so you understand that component. So I'm looking at that stuff being December. It seems like a lot, but I think a lot of it will be, uh, we'll be able to get through quickly. Looking at January, we'll look at medical calls in depth. Um, I'll want to get some information uh, related to, you know, we, we have a pilot program right now for advanced life support and talk about what is advanced life support and what is basic life support and understanding what's, what each of those are so that we can understand what it takes for us if we wanted to go to advanced life support throughout the city. And because that's one of the big questions that I want that's important for us is we've, we're, we've been doing a pilot study. Is that something we should be continuing to look at? Is that desired within the community? Um, I want to have a discussion about ambulance service. I'll ask Nelson to provide us some information regarding the ambulance service provided and then obviously have John provide some information regarding um, their AMR's provision of service. Um, talk about whether there's alternative types of vehicles to go on medical calls for our department. It's been brought up that we should be looking at that. And then um, and then what is there, you know, what is the cutting edge for future for fire service and medical call service and looking at what are, what are the prognostications of changes that might come in the provision of service for the future. In February, we'll look at our um, fire station locations. Some of the information you'll get, uh, we have some detailed descriptions of where each fire station is and what's available in that station. We'll provide that to you so you can have an understanding of where our locations are. The city, um, uh, six, eight months ago, we purchased a piece of land up in the northwest section as a potential location for a station in the future. And so we want to talk about our locations. Is that something we should be considering? Um, the idea of, is brought up about reducing the number of stations that we have. And some have said we need to increase the number of stations that we have. So let's talk about that and what what's and explain the budgetary impact and then getting your input on on that also help you understand what fire apparatuses we have what our needs are for the future and what those types of things cost we'll talk about personnel costs for firefighters the training that they go through what type of recruitment we're having and seeing uh, people that are interested in continuing to to join the ranks of firefighters in our community in february the other thing is when um, at that point in February, as we progress with this, I'll be looking to see about getting public input and uh, having a period of time in February for starting public input so that others that may be following along as we do this uh, would be able to uh, give their own personal input. Do a little bit more public input in March. And then in March, we'll need to develop our recommendations to the governing body. Um, on, you know, what we think the future of fire service should be in, in Topeka. And, you know, and then that way preparing our report to give them on our recommendation. So I know I went through a lot of stuff. Are there questions? Are there things that you already think about that we're missing from that list that I just kind of rambled through? Sandra? Can you go back? Can you go back to number three and tell okay. us the purpose? Sure. Well, I've looked at the purposes um, to uh, the charge of the committee is to study the current provision of fire service in our community and determine the appropriate level and type of fire service for Topeka for the future. So that you know, we first need to know what we're doing now and and discuss that, understand that and then determine what direction we're going. Because we have a couple of, uh, you know, in my mind, big initiatives that are going and, and being discussed, and that's the uh, ALS versus BLS service for medical calls that we do. Um, 
our stations and how we're doing our stations and whether we need to be adding stations or can we add one and take one away as I proposed uh, about over a year ago. Is that something that works? You know, and all those things, then talking about, you know, doing all of that in the, in the context of the fact that it costs over a million dollars to, to, to fulfill the stationing, the, both personnel and so forth for a year and a, and a fire station. And, and so get those numbers and have you understand that as we take a look at uh, that level of service. Brent? Yes. Is it possible? I have not seen any information as far as per fire station, uh, the cost of uh, running each fire station and any projected projects per fire station or any projected problems per fire station. I think we can. Um... We have uh, our facilities folks have a list of projects that they are planning to do in each station over the next, uh, I would say it's at least five years out. And so we would be able to look at, you know, some of it's simple stuff like a roof or replacing a furnace or, you know, fixing the, the bay doors and some of it's simple stuff, but we have been trying to do uh, uh, renovation on fire stations every year to two years try and completely renovate a station and we just finished station three last year and so we have uh, intentions to go and do another one and so that some of these stations are old and they need a complete renovation and so we can go through and show you what the expectation that we've developed for doing those major renovations and and then the smaller things as well so If, if there is, if that is going to be looked at, it would be nice to know for sure before we really get deep into this as far as uh, yeah, what's, yeah. What's, what's feasible as far as how, how much money do we keep dumping into to a station. Right. And uh, I, you know, we're planning to look at that uh, the stations and uh, on my schedule as I have it right now in February. And so between now and then, um, even as we go into the January meeting, providing that information for you to start reviewing. Oh, Sylvia, sorry. Um, thank you, Brent. Um, I, I just hope that everybody, um, I, I, I don't know, do we have everybody at the table that needs to be at the table, number one? Number two, I hope our, our, our discussions are uh, focused in on what we're discussing. Um, and, I, and I know you did an overview, and I, and I appreciate that. But I don't want us to get caught up in can we afford it, can we not? I think we need to look at... Um, what we have, what we need to do and where we're going and then how we're going to do it. Um, because I just don't want us to get caught. Well, we can't do that. We can't do that. You no. know, the, the fire stations have suffered for so long. Um, and that's why they're in the, uh, the, uh, the way that the positions that they're in. Um, and, and it's, and it's really, 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 really terrible. Um, that these guys have to go and endure some of the things that they have to endure at these stations. And so I just don't want us to get caught up on that. I want us to look and see what we have. Let's put it on the table and see how we've got to move forward. And I hope we're able to chunk it out piece by piece that we're, we don't have so much thrown at us that we can't concentrate on one thing or the other because there's it's a, it's a lot. Right. Um, fortunately, I've been on here for a while, so... Um, I kind of know what's there and what's not, but for some of the others, it might be really, really hard, um, you know, to understand. Um, and that's the bottom line. Our equipment ex is expensive. Um, right. and, and I think, uh, I've, I've said this since 2005, we've got to educate the public because they don't care how much it costs but they do care when that when that truck doesn't roll up to their house and so that's that's the council's job and so i i just think 
you know, in looking at this, this is long and overdue. So I, I hope we can really focus on what we have and, and, um, and, and the studies. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with your statement. Just one second, Aaron. Um, I agree with your statement. I really do want to know what, what we feel we need for the community. Um, and, you know, cause even if we can't do it next year, we can make a plan that if this is the optimal that we want to have for our community, we can start working towards that. It may not happen in year one, but we set a set a plan uh, in order to get there. So you're right. That's something to definitely pay attention to. Aaron? Thanks, Brent. I would just quickly offer to this mainly to the citizens, but if anybody else has any interest, I, I'll be happy to do the same. <clears throat> uh, Sylvia, and Sandra and Christina are fairly familiar with the stations, um, but I know some of the citizens that are on, on this committee are not. And if they would like to go around to visit some of the stations, I'd be more than happy to, um, to do that with them, set it up with the understanding that with the COVID stuff going on right now, we may not be able to get as detailed and far inside the stations as normal, but I would be more than happy to, uh, to try and do that. If you guys just reach out to me, we'll uh, make it happen. Yeah, I think that, uh, yeah, work with, with uh, the Department of Management and Union and you guys make uh, a plan to, to do that for those that are interested. I think that's a, a good idea. Um, there's nothing better than showing up and walking through and seeing the facilities with their own eyes. Um, it's one thing to look at a picture, but to walk in and see where you make your meals, where you sleep, um, and where the equipment's stored is, is, is important. And that's what, yeah, I've been around uh, all of them once or twice, and I know what you mean. It's, it'd be important for people if they had an interest to be able to do that. So, yep, good suggestion, Aaron. Aaron. Any other... Comments, Aaron, I appreciate the offer and I would I would like to get your contact information at some point. I do appreciate the offer. Thank you. Yeah, and same for me, Aaron. So if you want to just send it probably an email out to all of us with your contact. Yeah. Okay, anything else that I that we should be putting on the list, Sylvia? Um, Brent, can we make one person, like maybe Luann, the contact person, if anybody needs anything or yeah. they need to get a hold of somebody, can she get a list for us together? Yes. But if, if, can, can we have Luann do that? If we think of yep. something we want to put on the agenda, yep. she can That's get why it. I have Luann on this call. She's going to help me out on being that point of contact for. Okay. That kind of so I, I, I think to the crew, if you, you know, um, Luann will send something out to everybody to get a hold of Aaron. So, so that there's, you know, we all know how to get a hold of her and we can all get the information to everybody. So we're not scrambling. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And you may have a desire that if you hear something and want to follow up the individual that was talking about it, uh, that way you have that opportunity as well by having that contact information. Good. That's uh, Mr. Mr. Chuck. Yes. I would like, like to offer up, especially to our three uh, citizens who I greatly appreciate volunteering for this, Mr. Keane, Martinez, and Sullivan. Uh, if there's anything from the fire department that they need, that uh, obviously we should have an email list that we could, if we want particular questions answered or requests because I, I think throwing all the work on Luann, I mean, if we're able to shoulder some of the requests a lot easier and then just keep everybody else abreast of what's being asked of us. Yep. Yeah, and this information that I rattled off, I will, it will be coming out to you. And I didn't want to send it until we had this kind of discussion to see what we were missing, and I can plug that in, so. Any other comments regarding the general scope and uh, items that, uh, um, topics that we might want to cover as we go through this process? And we can think of more. Yes, Christina. Thank you, um, Brent. I did, you know, initially the, the commission came about when it was getting a little bit hairy on council about, you know, the purchase of the new property and possibly closing 11 
on and on and on. But with the scope of everything that we're going to be looking at in the next several meetings and having a recommendation come up to the governing body, is there, might that also include uh, some of the real needs that are out there uh, that the fire departments have? And I'm saying in the way of, you know, like hazmat, um, updates, you know, to uniforms and all of that type of stuff. Is is that also part of, of this responsibility of yep. this commission? Yeah, that's why I definitely wanted Aaron and Jason and, and uh, his, his folks here to get their perspective. Um, you know, Chief Duke and his team are analyzing, you know, what the department needs and they're bringing that to me, but um, we need to have that as well. Um, from from their viewpoint and so i think you know but all of us together here we can identify those things and you know we'll have to prioritize at some point how we go through that um and make each of those pieces happen but i think that uh first step is to identify them and then from there we can make decisions on which which comes first okay thank you mm -hmm. All right, and, it, and as we go through this, if we think of another topic, which as we talk about various things, there's a very good chance that will happen. Um, we'll add those topics um, into the discussion and um, looking forward to, to hearing your viewpoints on, on these various items. So at this point, um, I've talked to Chief Duke and uh, he has, uh, I think you all received, there's a, Look, the standard to cover, big 77 page document, I believe it is. Yeah. Um, it really it has information about each of the stations and, and really anything you'd want to know about what's happening in the department right now. And um, what I'd like to do is have Chief Duke and the other staff members that he has there to uh, uh, go through and, and help with uh, in uh, describing. Um, some of that information and then let him, let you answer, ask questions that he can answer regarding um, that information as well. So, Chief, go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, hopefully, all you have got at least the electronic version of this document. We do have printed versions. If you want to leave your contact information, we can get the uh, hard copies taken to your home if that would make it easier for you. As, uh, as Mr. Truck said, this is a, the beginning of a rather large document. Uh, in fact, in December, we're gonna have questions on page one through 56, so please study hard and long. Uh, I'm gonna go through this really quickly because there's a lot of information in here and the document speaks for itself. It does a historical aspect of the fire department Obviously, we discuss all that. Could I share my uh, screen, please, Lou? All right, let me see if I can get this here done. Excuse me a second. Is everybody able to see the screenshot? Okay. Like I said, this is a rather lengthy document. It's self-explanatory, goes through everything within it. This is a document that we put together, uh, hoping to uh, attain uh, accreditation through the Center for Public Safety Excellence. This is just the beginning part of it, uh, showing telling the history, the story about the department and what it has, its assets and everything, the different divisions and so forth. So there's a lot of information here. And what I would like you to do, if there's something that you're not familiar with, that please contact us for explanation. You know, uh, it's, it's, we've got more information on what's on this paperwork, in fact, you know. And like I say, the, the, the unions have been very helpful as well with this. I'm sure they could give you a grand tour of any of the stations in your district or any other stations that you need to see. 
Uh, this will help you. I have two individuals here who can help discuss it, uh, one online, everything from emergency medical services, fire suppression, how we respond in different types of circumstances, our training, uh, and anything like that, our fire prevention, fire investigation. So if something piques your interest as to how and why we do it that way, we will get you a more in-depth information. And what we'll do, if I get a series of questions, I will actually share the question that you have and the information that you're requesting with everybody else on this committee. So everybody else is up to date with what's uh, been asked of, of the, from the Fire Commission. Uh, if you have any questions right now for me, uh, I'd be more than willing to uh, take them as I, I, go, through, I go through this. Uh, I don't know if you've had an opportunity to read any of it, but like I said, a lot of it's self-explanatory as to how and why we do the job we do, uh, the history behind it. Uh, this is 100, that's why we had the 150th logo up there. This was the 150th year for to pick a fire department, but because of uh, COVID, we didn't get to experience the celebration that we were had put together. Um, it explains everything about the, the government and the districts that they're in. Uh, it'll go into that. It'll are basically now we're looking we're looking at the uh, we're we're looking at our, our budget for uh, 2020. We're uh, we've got a preliminary 2021 that needs approved yet. 90 percent of our budget is spent on personnel costs. Uh, the rest of it is on, on uh, contractual services. That's all our. Uh, all our computers, our lease financing, the purchase of uh, vehicles and everything through CIP. If you have any questions on the budget, we'll be able to answer that. So what I'd like to do is just go through this. Like I say, most of this is self-explanatory. Uh, talking about the history and the geography of our, our city and the region and right down to the weather. Um, the history of the different large scale events that's happened in Topeka over the last 50 years or more. Uh, so we have the division, we have 12 stations. I'm not all if you're sure if you're aware of that, uh, those that uh, the, the civilian uh, volunteers in this committee, but there, there are 12 fire stations in the city of, of Topeka. And yes, uh, a few people have discussed uh, the age of these stations. And it's obvious that, that we have a lot of old stations and trying to maintain them in today's uh, fire service uh, with everything from uh, the simple as a backup generator, HVAC rather than boilers, uh, to making them uh, gender neutral uh, and just make the living quarters a lot safer for the, the people that utilize them for 24 hours a day. Uh, there's not much room in some of the stations. There's no room for expansion because of the footprint. Um, like I say, some of these stations are really old. In fact, they ran horses out of them. Uh, someone asked me, why are all the stations downtown? I know some of you have already heard all this before, but are so close together. Well, I tell them it's, they're a mile and a half apart. And the reason the mile and a half is that's how far a horse could run at full gallop before it ran out of steam. So that's why those stations are a mile and a half apart historically. But now we, we, we don't need to worry about horses or anything. What we need to worry about now is the, the data that we're now able to collect and utilize to determine how we can improve how we respond and how we do respond with what to different types of uh, calls that we have. It's not putting the wet stuff on the red stuff anymore. It's more than that. We do EMS, hazmat, technical rescue. You know, we, we, we have so much. We have advanced ALS. We've got basic uh, life supporting EMTs, paramedics, AEMTs. Everything has changed as to what we do. If you call 911, and nobody knows who to send because of the type of call it is, they send the fire department. That's basically what has historically happened. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the, uh, 
you know, how, how we operate operationally. You see the division chief of operations, that's Ty Christian over here. And I will get Ty to come up, sit here and speak about that. If you have any questions about how we operate out on the street and why we do what we do. Uh, Ty, do you have a moment, please? Yes. I'm going to step aside and let Ty talk about the operational aspect of it. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Share with you, uh, Topeka Fire Department has 12 working fire stations. Half of our fire stations are single company stations. That means we have one truck. The other stations have two trucks assigned to them. Currently, we have 12 engine companies, six truck companies. Out of those six truck companies, two of them are aerial ladders, which are platforms which will go up to 100 feet. The other truck companies are four box trucks. They carry no hose or no water. Out of two of those box trucks, truck companies we have, two of those, truck 10 and truck 11, also have compressors to fill air. They're a heavy rescue truck. So on a large fire scene, we can bring in two trucks to help us supply air for SCBAs. Also at station 11 is our high angle confined space team. We have a semi over there. They also are part of our boat rescue. Uh, we have a boat over there and we do some water rescues on the river. We also currently have two brush trucks, one stationed at station two and one at station 12. Where are they at? Do what? The addresses. Oh, the addresses is station two is at six and rice road. Station 12 is at 21st and Urish. Uh, matter of fact, we just got a brand new brush truck uh, last week. That's going to go into service at station 12. And they do respond all out through the county. We have actually gone out and helped the county on a few occasions. Also at Station 2 at Six and Rice Road, we have a rescue, another rescue boat that assists out on the Kansas River. Station 8 is at Fairlawn and Shungananga. It also supports our hazmat team. It's a regional hazmat response team, which we cover the northeast part of the state of Kansas. Uh, we also have three chiefs that run. We have car 101, who's a shift commander. We have car 102, who's a battalion chief stationed at station five, sorry, at 21st and Western. Car 103, it's stationed at 21st and Urish. And we have, so we have three running chiefs. So every call, every fire alarm that's dispatched in Topeka, we send two chiefs. One is to be in charge. The other one will be our safety officer and accountability. Anything else? No, I, that's fine. That's Anybody fine. have any questions? Or did I talk too fast? A question. Uh, um, what's a brush truck? I mean. <laughs> that's a, a good question. It's a brush truck. It carries 250 gallons of water. It's a pickup truck, but it's a little bit bigger pickup truck. We can carry two, three people in it. It has brush sweeps on the front, so we can actually take it off the road. It's four wheel okay. drive and we can take it off the road. We can take it through ditches, pastures and everything. So it's, like brush fire. Yeah, it's for brush okay. fires. I didn't know if it was like a hazmat and you brush people down or scrub them down. So no, that no. makes sense. <laughs> truck, and hopefully we'll get you some pictures of that too and, we'll, and take you out there and look and see how it operates. Any more Thank questions? You. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Actually, I think I am going to have some questions, but I think it had more to do with uh, Chief Duke, what he said beforehand. So maybe after everyone has made their presentation, because I, I do want to make sure I get these questions out to see if we can be provided uh, some ad additional information uh, that I don't see in these 56 pages of, that I believe is important. Okay. So I can, wait, I can wait till the back end on this. All right. Sounds good. Anybody else have any questions on the stations or Equipment, Ms. Ortiz. Um, thank you. Can you explain um, to everyone? Um, you know, you talked about the brush truck, where it was at, uh, where the laterals are. Um, just, just different positions that we have um, to so people can kind of get a understanding of um, where they're at. As as the location of all the equipment around the city, Celia. 
Yeah. I mean, um, I, I want them to understand, um, just like you did with the brush truck, you know, this is here, this is there, but we only have one, um, um, the high rise, what I'm, I can't even think right the now. Aerials? The aerials. And, and can you explain to them the location of where they're at? Well, um, we, we, we try to put the aerials downtown. Our biggest problem is, is, is having fire stations and aerials fit. So station five is a fairly new fire station. So we moved four aerial when it was there in the 80s and 90s over to fives. We also have eight aerial. It's on the west side of Topeka that helps cover the VA and everything on, on the west side. Five aerial downtown at 20 person western covers all the hospitals and all of our high rises in downtown Topeka. And then we do have an aerial in reserve. So anytime an aerial is being fixed or serviced, we have a backup. And I think it would be important um, to do that also with, um, God, I can't think. I just lost my train of thought. That was the aerials. You talked about where the boats were. Um, the, has, the hazmat truck is, hazmat, out yeah. is out of dates. Again, space. It's in an area where it can get on the interstate system and go many different directions. Uh, 11s, the high angle rescue confined space team is over 11s. That's a great place for that over there because the simple fact is of room. We have a large semi that that carries all the equipment on. So it's stationed at 11s again because of space. Again, easy access to get on the highways and go east, west, north, or south. And I think it'd be important to talk about station three, the training um, station, and what is down there. Straight, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let uh, Chief Training Kevin Flory talk about that, Sylvia. That's all right. That, that's fine. I just wanted everybody to understand that where we have things and we have them there for a reason, um, you know, so, so that they understand that, um, you know, people don't understand, like there might be one truck with water and one truck that's not with water. And so I just want this team to get a full understanding of where everything's at and why, and you did a good job just explaining that. So that's what I'm thinking in my mind right now of why we have this here um, so that, so they understand that. Um, like you said, the laterals are for the high rises and, and the, the groups of people that we serve downtown, um, you know, the high rises of the, of the government buildings and, and the hospitals, and you did a good job, but that's my train of thought. And if there's anything more that you could add to that, that would be great. Well, I think, uh, first of all, getting you out to the fire stations and having you a chance to visit the stations and looking at the equipment. Uh, you know, all of our fire trucks carry 750 gallons of water. All of our engine companies have a thousand feet of LDH hose, big, large diameter hose that we actually hook up to the hydrant. So we would love to get you out where you can physically walk around a fire truck and, and see everything that it does. I, and I've been to the stations just for those that are on board that, that, that don't know to ask these questions. That's why I'm asking them. Thank you. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Flory and let him talk. Oh, sorry. Sorry. This is Chief Duke again. The goal, the goal, our goal is to the individuals that uh, don't have the full understanding of the fire service and how it works. We are wanting to take them out on ride alongs. We want them to visit the stations and talk to the men and women of the department and find out from them, not from us, find out from them about their job and how, how it works and what they feel, uh, how we could do a better operational job with, with the fire service and the EMS service in Topeka. That's, that's, that's our goal. I know there's a lot of subject matter experts at this table at the moment, and that's a good thing. But with the, the, the three gentlemen that have volunteered and anyone else that comes, we definitely want to get them, if they have the opportunity, out to the stations to visit. So uh, one thing I just want to say, uh, th th before Kevin comes up, you know, most the, the, I, I use the, trying to explain it to people about the fire service, it's like a three-legged stool. You need good people. You need the people, the equipment, and training. And if you're short on any of those, that stool's not going to sit upright. So this third, uh, the equipment in the stations, you, you're aware of right now and how much work uh, we need done 
to the stations, but our equipment's starting to pick up. We have a purchase plan in place where we've been able to replace older equipment. Uh, and like uh, Miss uh, Councilwoman Ortiz says, they're, they're expensive, but we're, we've got a plan there to try to replace the equipment so we're not driving something that's over 20 years old because that's not safe. But, uh, for us, things change, equipment changes, safety parts often change and everything. So, but to, that's the part of the equipment Chief uh, Christian talked about the, the people, the, me, the men and women, the operational aspect. And now the third part of that leg stool is the training aspect of that. And that's uh, Chief of Training Kevin Ford is going to speak to you about that. I would ask if you have any questions at all. There's a, there's a chat room in here. And if you want to just send them through chat or by email, we can get back with you if we can't answer the question right now. Kevin? Good evening. Just uh, want to take a few minutes and talk about the training division. Uh, the facility at 324 Jefferson here is our main training academy. Uh, this building was built in the 1960s, the early 60s. It was built as a training academy specifically. Uh, it and Station 3 were the only things down here. Fire administration was actually still over at uh, 719 Van Buren at the time. Uh, over the years, things changed. Uh, fire administration got brought down here. Um, fleet maintenance got brought down here. Facilities were built for them. So a lot of the ground area for the training facilities have been uh, eaten up over the years with that. On the site, we have a five-story concrete training tower, and we also have a two-story metal uh, burn building that we can conduct live, uh, live fire burns in. And Basically, there's a few on-ground props, uh, roof ventilation props where firefighters can practice uh, skills of cutting holes in roofs, things like that. And there also are um, some what we'll call search and rescue props built within the concrete tower so we can utilize it still. As far as training needs, uh, the training firefighters each year uh, are asked to meet as part of a, a standard, what's called the Insurance Services Office's uh, standard. Uh, they're asked to individually meet 192 hours of training, and that's for every firefighter on the job. And then they, specific to their positions, there are other training hours that they have to acquire. Uh, that would be like an extra 12 hours for an officer, extra six hours of hazardous materials training, things like that. So we conduct all of that training, or the, I won't say all of it, but the majority of that training, the hands-on pieces are done here. The rest of it is done in the stations by the company officers uh, that they take care of that. And then we also support all the technical rescue training, the hazardous materials training, and as well, uh, all the EMS training. The state of Kansas requires all of our EMTs to have 14 hours a year at a minimum of uh, EMS training to maintain their license and we supply that as well in conjunction with the EMS division. So that's kind of in a nutshell uh, where we're at. Our, our division is made up of myself and three training officers. Currently we're conducting a recruit academy, so we also are responsible for all the new hire training as they're brought in. Uh, we run those guys through a 12-week academy, so that also helps meet uh, things that are required by the insurance services office. So with that, are there any questions? Uh, Ms. Valdiviakla. Go ahead, Christiana. Okay, thank you. Um, Chief Duke, I know that you had said that you wanted us to study pages uh, one through 56 before our next meeting. Okay. And I, while I haven't gone over everything solidly, I did have some questions on some information I believe is valuable to have as for our next meeting. Um, we know that this past year, uh, station, uh, the Northeast Quincy station, uh, uh, station one had been uh, shut down quite a few times. And so I believe that it's very important for this committee to know station shutdowns uh, for 2019 and 2020. 
uh, by station and um, because I think that that's going to be you know that's going to raise questions some are going to be able to be answered some are not etc you know shortages with employees uh, all of that the other thing is is that and I wanted to see about getting that for 2019 2020 but when that information is gathered can we also have where that call ends up getting routed to if a particular station <clears throat> uh, is closed um you know i do not have the familiarity like you know uh and i'm wanting to develop more of a familiarity so when any station is closed across topeka it would be beneficial to know where that is routed to also, I know that there's probably nothing that we can do about this, but I know that um, for stations that are closed, for whatever reason, how much it might skew the numbers that are, have been provided, at least for 2019, on how many calls that a station actually received. I don't know if calls, say for station one, if maybe there was some time during 2019 when it was closed if the call that comes in there if it adds to the numbers on the station that it's routed to or if it stays on the number that it, the call originally came into i would like to have a better understanding about that and then also when you look at the pages uh 51 and 52 when you're talking about community uh, threat and risk assessment, I see that you have an, a number of elements that are shaded in red and then orange and then yellow. Are these threat assessments listed anywhere by the proximity to either the station that you know that might be impacted or, or have to make that call or by particular city council district i'm asking that because when i look at district two we are by the river we're by the railroad tracks we have a number of bridges we have out in north in that northwest area where chris sullivan lives you have a lot of rural area and in really dry season like we're experiencing right now are very prone uh to you know could be prone uh to to brush fire we are close proximity in the district to uh 470 and also i-70 so if there's any spills uh any kind of chemical spills so I am not saying that I have an expertise on all districts, but what I do see is, is District 2, and I see a number of vulnerabilities. And I'm wondering if we could get any type of uh, assessment uh, broken down um, by districts or quadrants even of town. Thank you. Yes, and, and sorry, uh, Councilwoman, my words at reading 56 pages before next week was in jest. Oh, I thought it was homework. <laughs> no, ma'am, no, ma'am. <laughs> but if, if you did go through this book, it does show you uh, the risk assessments, tries to, in layman's terms, the best way to understand what a risk assessment is and what levels. They are low, medium, and high risk. Uh, some are by frequency. Uh, uh, compared to uh, the high, some of the high risk, maybe low frequency, but a high impact. And just like you talked, uh, even another place you have down there, you have Burlington Northern Railroads flowing through there and everything, and Union Pacific. Uh, they did a hazmat study last year. I'm trying to remember if you were on council then, and it's uh, pretty. Uh, interesting that's to see the types of uh materials has hazardous materials uh, that flow through the city of topeka's three roads uh, and over the railroad lines and in close proximity to population uh there is a, a chart in here i'm just trying to flow down to it if you excuse the these screens going by with all the stations and the, the far quadrants to get down to that area that you were mentioning uh, on the hazard risk assessments 
Yeah, it was page 52 and 53. 52 and 53, thank uh -huh. you. I can, I can move a lot faster there. You're on 37 now. Okay. 52, risk analysis, here we go, here we go, we're still, yeah, so this, this is part of the uh, accreditation, you, you got to learn about your community, and that's the fire service, I mean, we got to learn what's out in the community, population wise and everything, the types of hazards that, that are out there, like uh, industrial, uh, like the rivers, the railroads, and so forth. And then we look at uh, natural disasters as well. We're, we're, we're prone to the dry weather, like you said. So brush fires uh, can be a big issue, and they have been an issue the last few days. Uh, we look at the, the winter weather, how it impacts us, and how it impacts our service as well, trying to respond during uh, winter weather. And then also... You, you know, looking at the, those natural disasters like hurricane, uh, sorry, uh, tornadoes. Hopefully, you don't get a hurricane. But so, what this is, there's a program, the vulnerability assessment. You identify your hazards, and this this came through the Shawnee County Emergency Management. And I know that Nelson was a big part of that and did a great job with his team, letting us know what's coming through our, our community. Uh, I do have a copy of copy of that analysis that was completed by emergency management at the end of the uh, last fall and it was very extensive it, it spoke about how we had major industrial parks maybe near uh, in and around uh, residential areas like bird to northern how close that is to some parts of oakland and if they ever had a derailment there, even though most of the work is done is on the locomotives themselves, there could be still a hazardous issue. I know they've had countywide training. I think it was in 2017, there was on a railroad uh, incident where a hazardous material, and then we all worked together with, with our local partners and how we would respond. That was put on by emergency management which was a great uh, success for our hazmat teams. We are a state hazmat response team. So we're the closest hazmat between us uh, and is Kansas City, and I think Manhattan uh, are the closest ones. So if we have a hazmat incident in, in, uh, in and around Shawnee County or one of the closer counties, uh, we could be asked to respond to those. But our primary response is for in the, the area of Topeka. And if we needed assistance, obviously mutual aid with those other uh, hazmat teams throughout the state, they would come in and help us if we did have a big incident. But yes, the community risk is, is very important and it's something that we need to do more often, uh, at least every five, three to five years, because things change. The community changes, whether it's added more industry, more population, you know, even the types of uh, structures that go in. Uh, I've noticed uh, between 2015 and 2020, there was a certain area on the heat map that had grown in the number of calls and looked at the, the data that we have and found out that they had built uh, a couple of uh, nursing homes in that region that area. So that brought to where we're having more EMS calls. So that's why the growth, and that's what we're trying to look at. We're trying to take the data and find out how it's impacting us, not just now, but how it could impact us in, in, in the future. So we want to look at the data. To, it's got to be data driven uh, to see how we're going to move or shift or change or how we respond and what we respond with. Yeah, and I and I think that this is you know wonderful information. The specifics of you know what I'm asking in the way of of reports, um, you know, I can email that to you to go over that because if there's a possibility to to draw up those reports, I mean, I know that you gave me something on on how much you know how many times station one was closed for 2020 but i think it's important that the committee look the commission as a whole uh look at this to get a better understanding because the bottom line is we're going to end up looking at the bottom line and um we need to see that for all stations of course i'm going to be more concerned about you know district two but understandably you know as a whole what what we've been looking at the past couple of years for closures 
Yeah, yes, ma'am. I understand. Yes. And in 2020, sorry, excuse me, let me go back. In 2019, there were no fire stations closed. We, we filled them all the whole time. That's if good. they were closed, it was for a minimal period. If someone got hurt, we had to wait for someone else to come in to work to make that uh, equipment to have the minimum manpower on it to respond in 2019. I think the last time this happened, and Aaron and Jason, uh, 2000, and the last time this happened, where they closed station because of manpower issues. 2001. 2000, and, was it 2008 during the downturn? Yes, it would have been around 2008. Yeah, and that was because of revenue shortages, um, you know, having to pay overtime. That was the last time. This was uh, this, a decision that was made uh, through administration and the city manager's office and then the deputy city manager's office to try to lessen the impact of revenue because we didn't know where COVID was going to take us. So I, I can get you that information, ma'am. Yes, and I will get that information to anybody, whether station one or, or, or station nine. And I'll follow all this up with an email because I know that that was a lot that I just I said there, but I think it's all vital. Yes. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Uh, Craig. Ms. Clear, Ms. Clear? Chris, go ahead. Um, hey, um, I, you had mentioned that you, you wanted to know more from people and citizens and firefighters on how we can do things better and get things done. And I appreciate you saying that. My, my concern and my want is once those are stated, that it actually gets done. I mean, we have had these conversations before and we've had some good conversations and there's been some um, good directives come out of that, but then it stops and they, they, it either doesn't carry on or um, it, it, it just ends. So I hope the ideas that we do come up with, this isn't just to fulfill some kind of, um, you know, something that we have to do as a city or for Brent or for the council, but that this is actually going to be used. What we talk about, that, that it's really going to be listened to and put into effect, if it can be. But um, I would just want to say that because it seems like we have started these conversations a lot of times. And then it gets pushed away. So we start another one and we go through all this information. And I, 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 I'd hate to think of what Sylvia thinks because she must have been through this a number of times. So we need to make this work. If we're, if we're going to do this commission, we don't, this has to be, um, it, it, we have to have something come out of it and not just let it in so we can start over on another commission. Um, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. It does. Thank you. Uh, one, th one thing, I, 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 do, I know you're giving up your personal time and everything, and I know this has been a lot of information to try to divulge and take in. Like I said, if, if you read the document and you don't understand something, you have questions, please email us. Uh, anytime you want to go, come down to the stations, and talk to the firefighters uh, and learn what they do face to face, please do. Uh, I ask that you wear a mask and tell us that you're coming so we can try to accommodate that, to make sure we have social distancing. This is really trying times for us. We've had uh, programs that we've uh, had to halt because of this COVID, especially when it comes to community risk reduction from the smoke detectors to the school visits to walking the neighborhoods after a fire and trying to get people to make sure that they have smoke detectors in their home. I know uh, Councilwoman Ortiz is very, very big on this. And I know we've let her down on this because of this COVID situation. But please understand, we, we want to do the best we can with what we got. And that sometimes you're dealt so much and you can't expand on it because of your, your resources. 
but we have to try to get, to get better at what we're doing uh, with what we have and see if we can do something just different to make it better and not impact the, the response capabilities of the fire department as a whole. Uh, one, one last thing. I don't know if uh, you see hmm. this on the screen. Yeah, I was going to ask a question, Craig, if I could. Yes, sir. Real quick. Uh, I was looking at what you had on the screen, and I, I believe I have all this uh, uh, electronically. Uh, however, I was looking at the contract fire protection. Yes. Uh, can we get a full listing of, of uh, all the contracts that you do have in town? Uh, this is basically what you see right now is what it, what it is. So those, those, those are the three that you have? Yes, those are the three that we have at, at this time. Uh, that would they pay a fee for us to respond into their areas, into that those addresses? Okay. They're not part of the Topeka city. They're they're uh, out out of the border of the city. Yes, but for insurance purposes, they needed a better response, mm -hmm. and they're getting it from the city. Very good. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Chai, do you have something? Um, I'm just trying to think of those other items that we needed to cover tonight um, with your information. I think the only, um, I think uh, uh, would it be good, Richard's on here, if he could talk about what type of uh, medical response we're currently providing and what the difference is between BLS and ALS, just a nut, real short uh, version, just so people understand how we respond when it comes to medical calls. The FE is uh, capable of doing it. I don't mind. Uh, as you know, also, uh, Fire Marshal Har Harrison's not available right now, but he will be here for the December meeting. Right. We'll hold. So we want to fill that up then with what his division does. Yeah, we'll hold his questions for next time. But, uh, Thank you, Chief Manager there. So uh, just in the interest of time there, I think as the manager is alluding to, so basic life support is offered throughout the entire Topeka Fire Department throughout the city right now. Um, basic life support would include basic CPR, AED, bag valve mask, the, the skills authorized within protocol that all your EMTs of which every firefighter in the city of Topeka is at least an EMT at a minimum. When we transition to advanced life support, this moves into IVs, this moves into medications, this moves into rhythm interpretation and other advanced care uh, related to either trauma, but primarily around that, those using medications to intervene. So a, a really good example is a cardiac arrest um, would be we're going to do the CPR, we're going to do the AED, we're going to do a basic airway that's available throughout the city of Topeka currently. In 2000, uh, or, yeah, 2019 here in January, we began the pilot program where we have our paramedics currently at stations, uh, station eight out at 29th and Fairlawn and out at station seven there at Huntoon and Oakley is where our paramedic companies currently operate the trial programs. And so we've been collecting that data on, along those parts there, lots of different ways to look at an EMS call, but those companies there, when the paramedics are, are present, have have all the equipment to offer that advanced life support. And that's the data that we've been collecting relating to that and, and supplying that to, to city manager in chief to, to be able to continue to evaluate it. So that's the short synopsis. Uh, the only thing I'd add to this is that uh, the Topeka Fire Department's been involved in, me, in EMS since at least 1913. We've gone through the records, we found the calls, we've been doing some form of uh, EMS service to at least uh, since 1913. Um, we expanded the EMT program, I believe it was in 89. Uh, we hired uh, quite a few paramedics back in the 2000, 2001 timeframe. And those are the paramedics that we've been operating with out of the stations there currently, again, at engine eight and engine seven, based off of when we looked at response times, the number of calls, we didn't get 
specifically into call types, but now we have all this good information available. So that's the short version of BLS versus ALS, what we offer across the city. Um, our AMTs um, are able to practice, but they have no equipment assigned to them. So that's that middle of the road that they can offer both advanced life support and basic life support as well. Perfect, Richard. That's what about the level that I wanted to go through for tonight. All right, uh, other questions. Uh, I can't see everybody on the screen, so if you have a question, unmute yourself and ask it. I have a question. Okay. Um, so you said there was, what, two months that we're going to have just information, be given information, is that what you said? Yeah, this, we will, uh, the previous studies that have been done, and I will get um, a little more detail of what we're going to cover in each month. And so we will go through uh, things in much more in depth as we go along. Um, well, I'm afraid, I'm afraid we get all this information and then we're going to have like two hours to discuss it all and come up with all these decisions. I'm not sure one meeting is going to be enough for that. Yeah. You know, after we get input, so we have all this information and all this input and then no time for discussion. And well, we know how long that can take. Yeah, I know. Um, what I would say is, is that um, my expectation would be is that as we go along with these subjects, that we have a discussion as we go along. So if we, when we get into the in-depth discussion about, um, uh, let's just, I'll pick a subject, basic life support versus advanced life support and what we want to provide. I would expect that we'll present the information and that night have a discussion about what do you think our community should be at for a level? Should we okay. not do ALS and, you know, really let the AMR paramedics uh, do their response? And, uh, you know, I think that uh, that's, you know, I hope that we can have a discussion because then it'll be fresh in our mind and we have a discussion that night on those particular items. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Hasn't that already been decided? And then there isn't there already money in the budget? And hasn't this already? Well, with with regards to ALS, there was money put in for a pilot. And so that's what we've been doing. And so but beyond taking it beyond the two current companies that we have um, doing it, we, we're not expanding it. It was simply using those companies experience to get some information that then can be used to discuss whether or not it okay. should go across the city. And so okay. we'll present that information and then we can have a discussion that night as to how we do that. Um, we can, we, can we ask the governing body for then for more time if we feel, if we deem that's necessary or is this a report yeah. that has to be? I think it, it, it coming from the committee itself, it will be, you know, we actually, I intended that we would have already, we would have already right. provided our response, but when COVID hit, cause we were supposed to start April of this year doing this. And we so were, if we'd have followed the same schedule, we would be wrapping up right now. So um, if we feel like we're being rushed and we need more time for discussion, that's easy to do is to go back to them, especially since I have a number of them on the committee and they can help me make that argument that we need more time besides just me making that argument. Um, so we'll get engaged here and we'll see how it goes. And if we feel like we can't make a decision in the next five months, then we'll ask for an extension of whatever amount of time we need. These are big decisions for our community. And so if we need more time, we'll take more time, but yeah. we'll set this schedule. And um, as we go, if we don't feel we can accomplish it, then we'll request more time. Okay, thank you. Brent, just to piggyback on what Sandra was saying, I agree. I mean, I think having the schedule set is wonderful, but just like you said, these are serious issues that we're looking at. And we know that we have citizen involvement, which is so integral. So with the culmination of, of citizen, employee, and elected officials, it may take 
uh, more time to hash this out with these yeah. big decisions. And so I would also think it would be a wonderful idea if needed, as we have these complex discussions, it, uh, I think in many of these areas uh, that there just be that leeway. So I, I appreciate Sandy saying that. Yeah, and the thing that I'll add is part of the reason that I pick April is that we have a budget that we start formulating in April. And so generally April was, for me, was chosen in that that way, if there was something that this committee agreed and then the governing body agreed we needed to do, we would have the opportunity to incorporate it into next year's, to 2022's budget early, you know, start incorporating that early enough into our numbers and not be caught unable to, to react. So that's why at least I was targeting April. And then if it's, you know, can't happen, it can't happen. Um, it's, it's just a good target for us to be able to maybe make an impact in the budget. Mr. Trout, it's Aaron Mahan. Could I have just a minute, please? Hey, Aaron. Yeah. Um, I just moved back to the, uh, the vulnerability assessment that was in there real quick, uh, just so we can, so everybody understands the process as we move through this. Shawnee County Emergency Management pretty much uh, does that uh, almost every year. Uh, that's updated. It's the threat and hazard identical threat and hazard identification and vulnerability assessment. It's a community wide, county wide that is built, discussed, and put together by a team of different response disciplines. Uh, that does include the Topeka Fire Department, Police Department, the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we bring in uh, a couple of our emergency management and hazardous materials specialists from the 190th uh, out at Forbes Field. Uh, our, uh, we have a representative from the local emergency planning committee on there, and it's a huge endeavor uh, that we sit down, we go over this, and we think about every single thing that could possibly impact Shawnee County or the city of Topeka. Uh, once that's put into the formulas that you can see at the very top, uh, that program puts it into the ranking of what we really need to be focused on uh, and concerned about. Uh, and then what that also ties to is, is the, the study that Chief Duke was referring to uh, earlier about hazardous materials, what's out on the highways, the streets. Um, last year, and, and Nelson spearheaded this, uh, it's called a commodity flow study, and we do that every 10 years. Um, and yes, we did with the results, we discovered there's a lot of changes. It's not just I-70 and Highway 24 and the major uh, highway routes. It's also what comes into our airports, where is it stored at, how's it trans how is it transported from those warehouses, mm -hmm. and where is it going. Uh, also, uh, what is uh, carried on, our, on the local railroads. There's a huge amount of railroads that come in here with a lot of really, I will just bluntly say, nasty stuff on it. Uh, and it's usually just moving through somewhere. So we look at all of that information and then back to the specific question, we take the FIRA, we take the commodity flow study results, and we take after action reports from different incidents that have occurred uh, near certain stations, and we can apply those specific threats, hazards, and vulnerabilities to each of those stations and areas. And then we do what's called a hazard vulnerability an an analysis on that specific site or that specific area. So that, that's really kind of the whole process. And it's, it's it, it, we use an entire team to do that of those subject matter experts. So I hope that kind of clears up the process a little bit as to, to kind of how we do things. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's really uh, a much fuller description of what you guys do. And I appreciate that better understanding for all of us. Good stuff. Any other questions or comments from folks? Yeah, this is David. I think as we continue meeting and talking through each of these different aspects, for me, it'll be helpful to see also like where the department wants to go with this. If there are any best practices or obvious weaknesses, that, that'll help me It'll help, you know, make decisions, that kind of thing. Right. No, that's, that's part of it. And, you know, one of the things we didn't mention tonight, or maybe Chief did briefly, is that we, we are wanting eventually this department to become an accredited fire department. And it has been something that's been desired for a while. But to do so takes a great deal of work. And uh, I think that looking at the things we are tonight is also something that's pushing us towards eventually being able to do that. There's no doubt we have a great fire department, but 
that's not the same thing as being an accredited fire department. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of information has to be submitted to show how we do business. And so that is a goal that I know the department has is eventually be accredited. Hopefully we'll get there um, near as soon. Anyone else have a comment or question? Unmute yourself and ask away. It stated earlier that uh, everybody's contacts and emails will be made available. Yes. And the list will be sent out. Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Chief Duke, did you have anything else you feel like you missed from uh, what you were going to present tonight? Craig? No, no, I think this was a good start. Okay. This, this was a good start. There's a lot of information in that document, and that's only part of the bigger document uh, that needs to be completed. Uh, and I think this is a good start. Uh, but like you said, accreditation is more th than just this one step. There's a lot more to be done for that. This may be a good stepping stone, but we still need to go in the, the direction of how the Center for Public Safety Excellence wants you to, the, they basically give you a roadmap. You follow the roadmap by taking their instructions as to what you have to find out about yourself and how you deliver it. So I, I really think that would be a great achievement for the Topeka Fire Department. I think they deserve it. I think the city deserves it because they are a great fire department. And uh, I, I don't say that lightly. Uh, we had a young man, and I'm not sure if Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Martinez, Mr. King, a young man, uh, Lieutenant Matt Free, who won a, a state award uh, for heroism in uh, pulling a two-year-old uh, girl uh, from a burning uh, two-story structure. Uh, that's just part of the story. But this, this, this is just what his story is just one part of our big story. You know, these, these men and women go out on a daily basis and even during this COVID situation, they're still responding to all sorts of calls. And I think we got to do the best we can to help them make their job ease, uh, a lot easier and safer. And that's my 10 cents worth. Um, Chief Duke, I, I want you to know, because I have absolutely nothing to do with my life, I did read through this and it was very interesting. And you know what, it helped me understand why some of the information I get, I, I understand what it means. Like when you were talking about that flashover, and then I went and I, you know, saw that how, what that has to do with the time. That was really, that was really good information because then I'm not wondering, well, what, why isn't that? Why is it, you know, it, you really answered some really good questions with this. It was, it was very well done and, and I enjoyed reading it. Thank you, ma'am. Anything else? And then I'll wrap up. City manager, this is John. Hey, John. Hey, I know uh, when your original documents come out, one of the things on there was going to be a, an overview of our system and how we work in the city of Topeka. Do you have any idea of what date you plan on having that? The way we can have it prepared and be ready to roll. Yeah, that'll be a January meeting. Thank you. You bet. John, we need we need the uh, draft by tomorrow, though. <laughs> No comment. No comment. Uh, all right. Well, it's 730. We've done covered a lot. Um, I think we've helped around this out a little better or how we need to go forward. So very, very good input. And, uh, you know, the first meeting is always kind of one of the toughest ones as we try and get ourselves organized and so forth. Um, so the things you should expect to receive in the near future is the contact information of each person that's on the committee, 
You're going to get those past studies that we've uh, had uh, regarding the service. Um, and then I will provide the more detailed topics for the agendas for future months so that you'll know um, uh, what kind of things we're looking at doing. And then uh, we'll uh, provide that information as we go. Uh, any write-ups that go along with it, you know, prior to the meeting or so. We'll try and make sure that we get anything that um, we might be referring to document-wise. We'll try and get that to you at least a week or two ahead of time. We'll shoot for two weeks, but at least a week, so you have a weekend to take a look at it. And, uh, uh, but uh, as uh, was mentioned, uh, we'll need to work to try and get um, appointment to get in to look at, you know, a couple of the stations to get an idea of, uh, you know, figure out a time. I'll let you work with uh, uh, Aaron and Chief to get that figured out. And uh, we'll be able to give you a little firsthand uh, bird's eye view of what's going on. Anything else you feel like you need between uh, now and the next meeting? And uh, I'll, I'll figure out a time uh, to get a hold of uh, co-chair clear here and we'll talk a little more and see if uh, there's anything, uh, put our heads together and see what we might be missing uh, in the interim. All right, and uh, yeah, feel free to email me. You'll have my contact information on there too or, or uh, Sandra clear uh, regarding topics to add to the agenda come to your mind. Well, great start. I appreciate everybody's time. Right. And look, yes. Can I just say one thing before we adjourn? Just sure, a Christina. big, big thank yes. you to all the citizen participation. Thank you for taking your time after work to be a part of this. Great. Now, one thing I will say is that, uh, um, We'll, we'll hopefully be able to add Councilman Lesser. He also covers a, a different part of the community. So uh, that'll, that'll be good too, to get uh, more participation from uh, another governing body member. So uh, we'll look for him hopefully in December joining us. So, all right. Great. Well, thank you all. Have a good uh, Thanksgiving and uh, look for emails from us coming soon. Thanks, Chief. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.